Hello, welcome to the plaza. The Plaza Hotel is one of those buildings that the second you see it, it just says New York. The plaza's always been a place where people know it, people want to go there. It's the ultimate global calling card. It really speaks to the history of wealth in New York, the history of celebrity in New York. It's also one of New York's most beautiful buildings and most recognizable. You enter into what is known as the Fifth Avenue Lobby. The Plaza Hotel opened in 1907. Construction began in 1905. It actually replaced an earlier Plaza Hotel that opened in 1890. After the turn of the century, this was the city's premier hotel district. The Plaza wanted to compete on that level. The Plaza is in a style we call French Renaissance. The chateaus of the Loire Valley, the crystal chandeliers, the white and gold mirrors. This is all high style of what I like to call the Gatsby era. A novel, by the way, which has scenes set in the Plaza Hotel. When the Plaza was renovated in the early 2000s, a new hotel lobby was created. Originally, 90% of those who checked into the plaza in 1907 were full-time residents, and the original restaurant that was in this corner of the hotel was divided into two. One half, which was at the corner facing 58th Street and 5th Avenue, was for the permanent residents, and then there was a divider where transient hotel guests would eat. After the 1929 Wall Street crash, that space became a showroom for the Studebaker Car Company. Following Prohibition, the owners of the hotel transformed the space again into the Swank Persian Room. This was a nightclub where many famous acts performed, including Eartha Kitt and maybe most famously Hildegard, who was a 1940s chanteuse. Another regular performer at the Persian Room was Kay Thompson. When she was performing at the Persian Room, she used to always do this little girl voice. One of her friends who was an editor at Harper's said, you've got to do this as a book. And eventually it was the start of what would become the literary fictional heroine Eloise who lived at the plaza. If you walk through the hotel lobby, you can see the check-in desk on your left and on your right are the elevator banks that take you up to your suites. While we're here, let's grab a room key. Hello, this is the key for your room. So we're walking back through the Fifth Avenue lobby, and we're going to take a left, which leads to the famous Palm Court, but we're going to wait to visit the Palm Court. Instead, we're going to go around to the South Corridor. As we walk through the corridor, we enter into the section of the hotel known as the Shops, a largely new area of the plaza since its renovation. The area where there's now boutiques used to be an entrance that was created as part of the 1921 extension, and during Prohibition, people would often use the hotel suites to partake of alcohol, and the entrance on 58th Street was a favorite, discreet entrance into the hotel. Here, we come to a splendid staircase. The ceilings of the landings are particularly notable. The work of John Smaraldi from Palermo, one of surprisingly many Sicilians who contributed to the design culture of New York City. We're going up two flights to the Grand Ballroom, which is perhaps best associated with the plaza and weddings. Some of the famous ones include Donald Trump to his second wife, Marla Maples. Also, Eddie Murphy he was very well liked by the plaza staff since he gave $100 tips following his wedding. Ballrooms are extremely important to big hotels. They generate revenue. They make the hotel into something important to the city that the hotel is in. Now, the architects were Schultz and Weaver, not Henry J. Hardenberg, whose original Plaza Hotel ballroom is long gone, not Warren and Wetmore, who indeed in 1921 designed a new grand ballroom. After that ballroom opened, it was replaced by this new ballroom designed by Schultz and Weaver. The decorative ceilings by Smiraldi, some of them may remind you of work that he did elsewhere. His work adorns many important American buildings, the L.A. Biltmore Hotel. He decorated the Blue Room in the White House in Washington, D.C. 
Someone who felt the Plaza Ballroom to be a really wonderful space was the novelist Truman Capote, who in November of 1966 held his famous black and white ball, one of the most eclectic guest lists in New York history, from Frank Sinatra to Andy Warhol to Norman Mailer, Robert and Ethel Kennedy, Vivian Lee. Now, if we go back down the stair that we came up, we come to a lovely foyer, again with the painted ceilings. Directly below the Grand Ballroom, we enter into the Terrace Room. When it opened in 1921, this was a restaurant. Bad time to open a restaurant with prohibition. The restaurant failed, and this became what it has been since, a function room. If you are very rich, you can have your wedding ceremony in the terrace room and your wedding reception upstairs in the grand ballroom. The chandeliers aren't original. They were added to the space at the behest of the hotel's publicity manager, Serge Oblensky, who was one of the great New York characters of his day, who ordered these chandeliers to be made based on chandeliers at Versailles. Back in the day, you could freely smoke, and the cigarette smoke turned that ceiling into a muddy brown, and it was all beautifully restored. And the terrace room was brought back to life. In fact, as we see it today, it looks better than it has looked since the 1920s. Now, rather than go back down by the stairs, let's take the elevator. So here we're in the shops again, and we're passing quickly through into the South Corridor. In this corridor, you will find a painting of a young girl, Eloise. The Eloise portrait is by Hilary Knight, who created the original drawings in the famous books. And it's actually the second portrait to hang there since the first one mysteriously disappeared in the 1960s, and no one ever found out exactly what became of it. The plaza hosted something called College Night, and the painting went missing. It seemed one of the great art theft mysteries of all time. In the 1970s, when New York was in financial straits and so was the Plaza Hotel, Kay Thompson was actually evicted from the hotel, and she demanded that the painting come down or any reference to Eloise be removed from the hotel. The plaque that said it was Eloise was removed, although everyone knows exactly who that character is. We're turning now into the Palm Court. And above it rises the building's light court. When the air conditioning equipment was installed in the 1940s, at a time when the owner of the plaza was Conrad Hilton, it led to the destruction of the stained glass skylight. The owners of the plaza hired a firm of stained glass restorers. Of course, it's not natural light anymore. Fiber optic lighting systems make it possible to shine artificial light through that stained glass. There are a lot of people, my mother from Chicago is one of them, who just feel that one of the quintessential New York experiences is tea at the Palm Court. One of my favorite stories involves one of the great actresses of the early 20th century, Mrs. Patrick Campbell. One of Shaw's favorites, she was the original Eliza Doolittle in Pygmalion, and she's seated at a table in the palm court, pulls out a cigarette, and lights it. It wasn't considered quite proper for ladies to smoke in public, yet the plaza didn't want to go into business alienating celebrities. What they did was they got folding screens so that other diners would not have to see her smoke. We are going to go up to the 20th floor, and we're going to see a suite. Now these elevators are new elevators, but they are replicas of the elevators in the original registration lobby on 59th Street, which is now the lobby of the plaza's private residences, and thus a space which is now off limits to the general public. The rooms are not original rooms. They are traditional in feeling, with traditional moldings, mantelpieces, and so on. This is the 2,000-square-foot Grand Penthouse Terrace Suite. Along 58th Street, there are 282 hotel rooms and suites, and along Central Park, there are more than 150 residences. Because of the plaza's multiple renovations, no two floors are the same, and the rooms vary in size. 
There's a long history of fabulous people living and staying at the hotel. Clarabelle Walsh, who supposedly moved in the hotel when it first opened, although I think it's more like 1922, she is credited with inventing the cocktail party. Eventually, she died in her plaza suite in 1957. Another famous resident is Princess Vilma Luaf Parlagi. She moved into the hotel in 1909. She brought two young wolves, an ibis, a falcon, several owls, and eventually she bought a pet lion that she let live in her plaza bathtub. This is one of the plaza suites that has an outdoor terrace. Walk to the railing and take in the view of neighboring rooftops. John Bedamillion Gates helped finance the plaza back in 1907 and lived in an enormous suite. And since he was an investor, he was able to design his own bathtub. And he made a huge pink bathtub. He was very large and he liked to take baths at least twice a day. Before the hotel's most recent renovation, there were over 200 hotel rooms that were not being used. Many of them were in a state of disrepair. The average room size used to be around 350 square feet. Now the average room is 500 square feet, with rooms ranging in sizes from one bedrooms to master suites. Now take the elevator down to the fifth floor. Rooms on the lower floors used to be the most expensive and glamorous. When the hotel opened, elevators were a relatively new technology, and guests were weary of staying in rooms more than a few stories above ground level. From the fifth floor, we can access the building's light court. This space used to look down on the lay light of the palm court before the lay light was covered over in 1944. Buildings are designed round these light courts for the obvious reason of getting light and air into all the rooms of the building. But the court itself puts a space at your disposal. That's why when so many older buildings were retrofitted beginning in the 1940s for central air conditioning, the big air conditioning unit was typically placed in these buildings' light courts. Why? Because that was where there was room. Now, a deck was built above that, and this really splendid small park with fountains and sculptures. Back into the elevator, and we're going to go back to the first floor and through a corridor that runs along the east side of the palm court and you see straight ahead a double door. Through the double doors we enter into a marvelous room. This is the Edwardian room. It has been reimagined countless times. This is another one of the designated landmark rooms of the plaza of which there are eight. The decorators of this room were a firm called William Baum Garten and Company quite famous in their day. This room is clearly based on the banqueting hall in Haddon Hall, a 14th century house in Derbyshire in England. These lighting fixtures were produced by the Sterling Bronze Company, who also made the chandeliers over the ramps that lead from the upper to the lower levels of Grand Central Terminal. What I think is especially effective about this ceiling is the way there are panels inserted that are mirrors. They reflect the space back. It makes the space seem even more ample than it is. You see out one window, Central Park, and then out the window right next to it, Fifth Avenue, a panoramic view like no other in New York. This is the corner of the plaza where traditionally the most expensive rooms were located up above. One such resident of a northeastern corner room, third floor, was Frank Lloyd Wright. In the 1950s, Wright lived much of the time in the plaza. This is where he got to know Solomon Robert Guggenheim, who lived in the plaza himself. And of course, Wright was commissioned by Solomon to design the Guggenheim Museum. We're leaving the Edwardian room. All the three corridors around the Palm Court are among the designated landmark interiors. The walls are of a beautiful marble called breccia. You might want to rap on it with your knuckles. This wall is solid marble. Nowadays, when architects want marble, they slice the stone to the thinness of deli roast beef. Not so with these walls. Here, we are peering into the lobby of the private residences. 
The private residence lobby is strictly off limits to everyone except for full-time residents and their guests. This was originally the hotel lobby. It has that beautiful marble mosaic floor. A movie called Home Alone 2 was made in the plaza. A young actor named Macaulay Culkin slides across the floor of this lobby. Back in the day, we always checked in on 59th Street. That long marble counter was the check-in counter. In October of 1907, that's the counter that was used by the first registered guest, Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt. That is also where in February 1964, John Paul George and Ringo all signed the guest register on their first ever visit to New York City when they appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show. We're going to continue through this north corridor. We're going to go down the hall now and head into the Oak Bar. Originally, between two opposing columns was an enormous wooden bar for which the Oak Bar was later named. During Prohibition, the bar was removed. Conrad Hilton reopened the Oak Bar in the Oak Room, and he outfitted the room with three murals by Everett Shin, an American realist painter and a member of the Ashcan School. The works depict early scenes from the hotel, including the old Vanderbilt mansion that used to be next door. You can see right away the stylistic similarities between this house, which was built in the 1880s and 90s, and the Plaza Hotel. Shin was one of the group of painters known as the Eight, who redefined American realism, gritty urban realism, yet these are very romantic pictures of old New York. This is the Oak Room, and it is much older than the Oak Bar. This is a 1907 room. It was designed by Henry J. Hardenberg, the original architect of the Plaza Hotel, together with the decorating from Elevon and Company. There's a wonderful chandelier which features a stein-hoisting maiden. One of the builders of the plaza was Bernhard Beinecke. He was a German immigrant. This room was his room at the plaza. Its inspiration, the great dining salons on the German transatlantic liners, which were the most prestigious ocean liners of the day, ships like Kaiser Wilhelm II, and there are these mural paintings of mythical Rhineland castles. There's a story they like to tell at the plaza that Walt Disney was impressed by those paintings and they inspired Cinderella's castle. I've actually tried to verify that story and have been unable to. One of the secrets of this room is that it's oak only down below. Higher up, the architect switched to a synthetic resin. The Oak Room was one of the last all-male restaurants in New York City until 1969 when Betty Friedan, a famous feminist, staged a sit-in and after a few months, the plaza announced that they were going to let women in for the lunch hour. We're exiting the building through the Fifth Avenue entrance. That Fifth Avenue entrance is very famous and it's well to note that it actually wasn't part of the original hotel in 1907. It was added in 1921 by the firm of Warren and Wetmore, the architects of Grand Central Terminal. The entrance on Fifth Avenue used to be what was called the Champagne Porch. When the Pulitzer Fountain opened on Grand Army Plaza, people would sit in the champagne porch and look over at the beautiful fountain and sip their cocktails. In 1964, when the Beatles made their first stateside visit, crowds packed into Grand Army Plaza, and it was completely filled with screaming teenagers, mostly girls. According to Greg Salamone, who lived at the hotel, John Lennon would don a ski mask and actually go down and sort of wander incognito among the crowds. The Pulitzer Fountain, the defining feature of Grand Army Plaza, post-dates the Plaza Hotel. The fountain wasn't completed until 1916. One of the stories that's famous about F. Scott Fitzgerald, but is likely apocryphal, One day, he was possibly inebriated, and he jumped fully dressed into the Pulitzer Fountain. Then Kitty Corner from the Plaza Hotel is the Sherry Netherland Hotel. Its architects, Schultz and Weaver, were famous for their hotels. There's another hotel just two blocks up Fifth Avenue, the Pierre, which the same firm designed. 
And then, of course, there is Central Park, which predates the Plaza Hotel by many years. Central Park was built principally in the 1860s. The hotel, of course, takes great advantage of Central Park. Many of its rooms were park-facing. Those rooms are now condominium apartments. Henry Janeway Hardenberg, the architect, designed the plaza to be a French chateau with skyscraper proportions. It's in the shape of a classical column. The first three stories are made of marble and they form the column's base. The middle is made of terracotta brick, and then the roof is made from copper and slate and it forms the column's capital. And the green color reflects nicely the greenery of Central Park. The plaza has been around for 111 years. It's seen everything from ushering in the trend toward apartment living to Eloise in the 1950s to today when you have a combination of a condominium and hotel. It really has always reflected the city around it. The Plaza Hotel is architecturally an icon of New York. It really stands for Grand Hotel in the same way that the Connaught is in London or the Creon in Paris. For New Yorkers, it's much homier than that, a place that contains memories of weddings, of debutante balls, going to tea with your mom at the Palm Court that everybody in New York has some memory of. And among the Grand Hotels of New York, the plaza really stands supreme. 